Greetings, brothers and sisters. I am Father Aaron Leach, and I hope all of you had a wonderful and, of course, safe Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, we celebrated here with just our immediate family, uh, which is fairly sizable. Uh, so we had a little bit of a party going. And, uh, of course, we had my dad and my stepmom on the, on the phone throughout dinner. So that was kind of nice. It was, it was kind of a way to use technology to get together, as so many of us have done this year. So it's wonderful that we have that technology. But I want to welcome you guys to our November uh, video, which is, as usual, coming late. Uh, so uh, first I have to thank my wonderful and ever so patient Patreon sponsors. Um, this year we had another uh, kind of a magical marathon to run this month, uh, starting on the first Tuesday of the Waxing Moon. Uh, we performed an eight-day invocation and consecration ritual for a set of talismans. Now if you're interested in seeing what that looks like, I will post some links in the description to blogs I've made when I've done this process in the past. And uh, you can also see it if you get a copy of uh, a treatise on the mixed Kabbalah. Uh, it's just, it is a wonderful and very powerful uh, consecration ritual. You spend eight days, starting on the day of the planet that the talisman is assigned to, and then every day at dawn, you have to uh, prepare the wax, melt it down, quench it in various substances, say various prayers and psalms over it, and then when you return to the day of the planet, which is the eighth day, that's when you actually pour that wax into the final mold and inscribe whatever uh, verse you're going to put on it. And it's, like I said, it's extremely powerful. And uh, we've always had great success with this process. And it's, uh, it, it's interesting I'm talking about making talismans because that is going to be the subject of today's video. Uh, but... Uh, just to finish my story on, on our magical marathon, not only did we have to do that for eight days, uh, we finished on that eighth day with a full uh, invocation and feast offering to uh, Samael. Uh, we, we try to feed Samael about once a year with a very large food offering and empowers him for the year to come. And of course, especially since these talismans were for him, this was the perfect time to do it. Mars is in, or at least was, I think it's moved out now, but when we did the ritual, uh, Mars was in Aries, which is a sign ruled by Mars, so it was a very powerful time to do the work. Um, but ending on that Tuesday, that was the Tuesday just before Thanksgiving, and that left us two days to prepare our Thanksgiving ritual, which is also a full invocation and feast offering, this time to the Archangel Zadkiel and the Intelligence Yophiel who are the archangels of Jupiter. So I, I don't think we've ever done that before. I don't think we've ever had to do one full invocation and feeding and then literally two days later have another one set up. So we ended up having two different altars set up, uh, one out in, the, living, in the, the dining room because the Thanksgiving feast itself is the offering to those angels. So we set their, the altar up either on the table or as we did this year, just beside the table. And they have their own plates and, and glasses, and they have they basically join the feast with us. So, and then we had the altar here behind me. Uh, had Samuel set up on it with his food offerings because they had to sit there for five days. And uh, today, in fact, uh, I'll be taking the offerings from the Jupiter altar down, and we'll be taking those to uh, a river uh, to disperse them back into nature. Uh, so that's why uh, I haven't been making videos. <laughs> so once again, I've pushed it all the way till the last day of the month to get this done. So again, thank you all uh, for being so patient, especially our, our, our sponsors and our patrons. You guys are just wonderful. But like I said, today I want to talk about talismans. And this is a very interesting subject because what you see in modern texts is very different from what you will see in the old texts. And there's a lot of times that those two will conflict with each other. And so we'll get questions from students about how to do one thing or another that either just does not fit with uh, the, the more ancient method of making talismans or, or even just directly contradicts it or is just absent entirely. So it usually involves having to do a full uh, history lesson on how this stuff works. So I figured I would just go ahead and do this here. It should be a fairly brief video, uh, but then again, I tend to ramble, as I've already done, so let's get on with it. 
one of the questions that we get most often in the in the Solomonic magic groups is how do you charge the talismans that you make? And how often do you have to recharge the talismans after you've made them? But what you're going to find is if you look through the old grimoires, there is no there is no mention of any such thing. Never once is uh, is it said that you have to charge a talisman. Never once is it said that you need to recharge a talisman. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, in today's modern occultism, we are very uh, post-industrial. Uh, we are used to electricity. We are used to batteries. So when we look at a talisman, we tend to think of it like a battery, that it is storing a charge, and that that charge can be dissipated or used up, and then that charge needs to be replenished. Um, but you got to keep in mind that the old, uh, those old grimoires came from a time when you know electricity wasn't something that everyone had in their house. Um, it was, they weren't familiar with batteries. And that's not to say that batteries didn't exist. I mean, there are ancient batteries that, that we've dug up in, in, in archaeological sites. Uh, but this wasn't, you know, people just didn't have batteries laying around their house. They didn't think of the world in that kind of way. So that kind of language is not used. Now, I will say that the, all of the old Grim Wars do speak of consecrating talismans. And I can fully understand how we can argue that that was the medieval pre-electricity uh, version of charging talismans, was to consecrate them. Um, it goes back to the priestly practice of consecrating a priest. Uh, as a priest, you should have lineage going all the way back to the apostles and Jesus himself. So the idea is that one priest must lay hands on a newly initiated priest and pray over him and pass that mantle on. So one can make the argument that energy is being passed down from priest to priest as this goes. And so we can bring that over into talismans and say that when a, when a, when a magician is consecrating his talisman, he is passing that energy on. And uh, like I said, very good arguments can be made for it. I'm, I'm not even contradicting that. Uh, but it's kind of a different subject. And once again, uh, because this was pre-electricity and pre-batteries, that's not how they viewed the process. They didn't look at it as, uh, as energizing or filling up a person. A, a priest doesn't have to go back to his to his the priest who ordained him or the bishop, I should say, who ordained him and get reordained every once in a while because that charge runs out. Uh, you won't find that in any of the ancient texts, not, not just the Grim Wars, but going all the way back to Egypt and Babylon and Samaria. Once an object was made, that was it. It was done. It it had the virtues that is the characteristics that it needed, and that was forever. And if you've ever had the fortune of visiting a, a museum that displays some of these ancient artifacts, uh, whether they're truly ancient from Samaria and Babylon and Egypt, or if they're a little more recent, such as going to the British Museum and seeing John Dee's Seal of Truth uh, the, made out of beeswax, it still exists, and uh, you, you can attest to the well, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to default to our modern speak here, but energy. You can feel that those, those virtues that were in, encoded into them when they were made are still there. And, you know, anyone who wants to contradict that and say that a talisman has to be recharged and recharged, I always give them this thought experiment. I say, let's, let's say that you have an opportunity to get your hands on the seal of, of, of truth, or I should say the seal of the true God, that John D. used on his table his holy table, to talk to the very angels that you see him record in his journals where he received the Enochian system. Or you can make one of your own or buy one off of Etsy or something like that. Which one are you going to choose? Well, the answer is always going to be, I want John Dee's, because it's not really about energy in our modern sense or, or in an electrical sense. It's, it's about who made it, when they made it, how they made it. And that infuses virtues into it that will never go away. That seal was made by D and used by D for specific things, and that will never change. In a way, I want to say that it's really more of a mimetic thing. That is, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's the same way that ideas and language are transmitted from person to person. Our culture is mimetic. It's made of memes. And I don't mean the funny little pictures you see online. That's 
those came to be called memes because they are examples of memes. But any packet of information that is transmitted from one human brain to another is a meme. The religion you practice is a meme. If you're an atheist, that's a meme. Magic is a meme. Culture is a meme. Disney characters are memes. Uh, science fiction shows are memes. Okay, These are all packets of info. And that's what's being transmitted, whether it's a priest consecrating, a, 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 I'm sorry, a bishop consecrating a new priest, or whether it is a magician consecrating a talisman. It's not about charging this object or this person with energy. It's about passing the lineage pat, in a mimetic sense. It's, you know, you are, you, you as the young priest have hands laid on you that have had hands laid on him who's had hands laid on him, who's had hands laid on him, all the way back to Jesus. So it's like, uh, remember Hands Across America, where they tried to get one single line of people across the United States? It's like that, only instead of going across distance, it's going across time. And that is very powerful. So this all plays into the talismans, of course. And this is why you won't see anything mentioned about charging or recharging a talisman. Once it's made, it's made. And what was infused into it at the time of its making, it will have forever. Now, let's get a little more specific about this. Let's talk about how talismans are made in the Solomonic tradition. Number one, uh, and this is shared with modern talismanic work too, it has to be made of the right materials and or the right colors. Um, So if if you're going to work with the planetary energies, your best bet, is to make the talisman of the metal that is associated with the planet you want to work with. So for Mars, iron. For Saturn, lead. For Jupiter, tin. Uh, For the Sun, gold. For Mercury, you would use Mercury or what they call fixed Mercury, which is just as toxic as real Mercury, by the way. Um, But also Mercury, uh, Mercury has all alloys as sacred to it. Anytime you mix two metals together, it then becomes a mercurial metal. So I tend, uh, for my talismans to Mercury, I tend to use uh, like a, uh, a nickel-silver uh, combination alloy. Um, it's very easy to get. It's less expensive than pure silver, which, by the way, pure silver can also be a mercury metal. Uh, there are some texts that have silver because it's the softest. It's the one uh, fixed metal that is most like uh, mercury, which is not fixed. It's fluid. Uh, and then uh, to finish that off, for Venus, you would use brass or copper. And for the moon, is typically silver. Uh, the idea is that the metal, these metals that run through the planet, that run through the ground, they are the veins. They are the blood of the planet. And unlike human blood, the blood of the planet is metallic and doesn't flow unless it's mercury or unless it's molten. Uh, so you find these veins and you are literally taking the blood of the planet that is especially sacred to and governed by the planet that you want to work with. So starting right there, you're using a material that is infused with that planetary energy before you ever come across it. It's, it's already built in. Uh, you can also use uh, wax, uh, uh, beeswax. You cannot use paraffin. I get asked that a lot. If you use paraffin, you're going to end up with something that's just going to bend and be very pliable and squishy, and it's, it's terrible. Um, but beeswax, once that hardens, it's pretty much forever. They're very durable. I'm not going to encourage you to just toss them around and be, you know, careless with them. But generally, if it's a small uh, disc, you know, like that or so, and it falls on the floor, it's generally going to not, you know, break too easily. And of course, if you bury them, uh, like with metal, they're pretty much in there forever. They're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to degrade. Um, and then, of course, you have the option of making them out of parchment. And it should be uh, virgin calfskin parchment. Uh, the old grimoires say that it needs to be male. Uh, be honest with you, that's a little hard to get. I'm not saying it's hard to get male parchment, but it is hard to find a company that can actually assure you that yes, this parchment came from a male. Um, honestly, I find it really doesn't matter if you're if you're using real parchment that came from a virgin calf. Uh, the sex of the calf is kind of lower down on the list. So if you can get mail, that's great because then you're following what the grimoires say. If it's not mail, I haven't had any spirit yet refuse it or be angered by it. So that's just a practical consideration. But it should be virgin calfskin parchment. And then, of course, in that case, 
you especially need to use the right colors in order to attract the planetary energies. Um, there's other considerations as well. There are sacred numbers to the planets, sacred animals. Of course, there are uh, names of God, archangels, angelic choirs. All of these are called the correspondences of each planet. And all of that would come into the figures that you put on it. The sigils, which means signatures of the angels or the planetary forces. Um, or if you're not doing the planet, I, I, I default to planets because that's what the Solomonic system focuses on. But you can also make them according to the four elements, which is very popular in neo-paganism. Um, and other forces, like astrological forces as well, uh, the, the 12 signs uh, of astrology. So these are all the things that have to come together, and whether it is the material you use, the colors that you in, either infuse, like with wax, you can infuse color into the wax, uh, or you can uh, use parchment, and even you can also use paper, as long as it's virgin paper, not lined paper. I see too many people just sketch out talismans on on notebook paper, you don't want blue lines going across your images. Uh, basically, you are simulating putting them behind bars if you do that. So unlined paper hasn't been used for anything else. Don't use recycled paper. Um, and you can then, that those will work, and, but they're not going to be as powerful. And that's the next thing that I want to get into as well. Uh, but to, to, to finish up and to summarize, the material that you use, the colors that you put on it, uh, be it uh, metal, wax, or, or paper. You can still put, paint them with colors. Uh, those all have to be uh, specific to the planet, and the sigils and seals and names and things that you put on it have to associate to the planet and or the spirit or angel that you're wanting to bind to this talisman. So that's where it gets its first round of virtues from. And also, when you're making these talismans, uh, you have to make sure that everything that you use to make it is consecrated. So inks, paints, paint brushes, pens, engraving tools, uh, just your entire art and creation kit that you'll use to fashion your talisman, that's all got to be consecrated beforehand. And the Key of Solomon has instructions for all of those. And uh, some other books as well. I believe the fourth book of Occult Philosophy has a lot of really good information on consecrating your tools as well. And if you're using a specific grimoire, um, sometimes that grimoire will tell you how it wants your tools consecrated. There may be specifics for those specific spirits. And if it doesn't, if it just kind of leaves it up to you, then the Key of Solomon or the Fourth Book of Occult Philosophy are good defaults to fall back on. Okay, so now we've got consecrated tools. You're creating these um, uh, talismans out of the proper materials, which are already inherently associated with those planets. From here, you have to perform an election. Now, you haven't created your talisman yet. You've just got everything together, and you have to perform an astrological election. This is the second way that virtues are infused into the talisman. You have to find a time when the planet that you're working with is strong. Uh, like, for instance, I said that in our Mars talismans, and our Samael talismans we just made, we made sure that Mars was in uh, one of its ruling signs, in this case, Aries. And that's what we'll typically fall back on um, for, for any planet that we're working with. We want it in one of its ruling signs. It also has to be strong. Uh, it can't be negatively uh, afflicted by especially the malefics. Uh, let's say you're working with Mercury, where you don't want Saturn or Mars to be uh, lending it their energies uh, because they will, bring, they, they will bring virtues that you don't want. They will counter what you want. You don't want uh, Mercury to be retrograde. Uh, you don't want Mercury to be in a sign that is its detriment or its fall. Uh, so all of these considerations and more. Um, you, you, the moon, of course, has to be waxing. Unless you're making a talisman to destroy or banish something away, then you want the moon to be waning. So you need to look at your astrological elections very carefully to find the best time. Now, in my classes, I generally teach that you should look for an election that falls on the day ruled by the planet. That is absolutely your best case scenario. But a lot of times you'll find elections that do not fall on that particular day. And that's fine. You can make the talisman on, an, on a day that's not sacred to the planet. Uh, there are other options as well. Uh, when you do an election, now this depends on how detailed your election gets, but when you make an election, generally where the stars are are where they'll be for the whole day. 
Uh, you want the star or planet, that is, that you're working with to be above the horizon. And um, you can work, even if you're, let's say, again, you're working with Mercury, which would be Wednesday, but you couldn't find a good election on Wednesday. But the next day, Thursday, put everything where you want it to be. Well, you can work on Thursday, but then you can work in an hour of Mercury. And there will be four hours of Mercury, uh, two during the day and two during the night. Uh, if you need a little more uh, extra time to work with your talisman, then those times will offer. And remember, at some times of the year, the days or the nights, depending on the half of the year, will be shorter than 60 minutes. So you can actually get down to a real time crunch with those. So you can choose to work instead on an older system. Uh, instead of using Solomonic magical hours, some of the older grimoires would tell you to work when the one of the two signs ruling your planet was coming up in the Ascendant. Uh, that'll be about two hours every day. And they're, except for the Sun and Moon, most planets have two signs they rule. So that's going to give you about f four hours. But instead of breaking it up into these four shorter periods over the day and night, you'll have a longer period to work in uh, at any whichever one you choose to go with. But the main thing is the, the talisman has to be made on that election. Now, this is essentially the birth chart of your talisman. It's your talisman's natal chart. So just like when you were born, you took your first breath, and that is when your natal chart was set. It's not set on your conception. The nine months in between don't, don't apply to this. But when you are born and inhale your first breath, breath means spirit. You're taking the spirit into your body, and that's when your attributes in your natal chart are set. And they will never change. You can do magic to mitigate negative aspects in your chart and to promote good aspects in your chart, but you're never going to be able to change your chart from what it was. You can't be born at a different time. So this is what you're doing with the talisman. So it, you, you decide what your goal is, and you find a magical time. You find an astrological election that fully supports what that goal is and has nothing working against that goal. And then you create the talisman at that moment, and that becomes its birth chart. And this is why there's no such thing as recharging a talisman after you've made it, because like with you, you can't change that birth chart. That talisman was made at that time, and that's forever. And if somebody digs up your talisman in a million years and puts it in some kind of you know, futuristic museum, that talisman will still have the same birth chart as when you made it. And that's where it gets its uh, attributes from the stars. And that's why they're forever. So this is why the uh, Grim Wars never mention charging a talisman. Now your next step will be um, consecrating the talisman. And as I said, this is kind of where you charge it, but not really. Um, but it is where you make it sacred. And that was the real focus of consecrating these talismans. Uh, once created, once they were born. Uh, again, I'm going to relate it to a human life. Uh, you've got the conception uh, and the gestation period, which is when you design your talisman, consecrate all the tools, um, even uh, draw out the talisman. We'll sketch the talisman onto the disc that we're using with pencil or whatever. Uh, just all the preliminary work is done beforehand. So this is basically the talisman germinating in the womb. Then it's born on the election, and that is its birthday. Then, just like with humans, you will choose a convenient time after the time of birth to perform the christening. And in the case of the talisman, that's the consecration. Uh, so you will take it usually on, uh, like the Key of Solomon will tell you to do it on the day and hour of Mercury, uh, because its talismans are generally geared toward helping you communicate with spirits. Mercury rules magic, communication, divination, uh, angels, uh, angels are messengers, so they're mercurial by default. Uh, spirits, basically everything. Uh, uh, Mercury rules occultism. Mercury rules witchcraft, magic, uh, hermeticism. It's all Mercury. So you can always default to the day and hour of Mercury. But another very powerful method is to choose the day and hour of the planet. So you can fall right back to that Solomonic hours system. So... Let's say you make your Mercury talisman on a Thursday, as we said before, because that was the better election. 
Um, you know, that's when you actually, by the way, because like I said, you can sketch everything out beforehand, but the actual painting or engraving or carving has to be done right there at that election. Then the next Wednesday, so almost a week later, uh, assuming the moon is still waxing or waning, depending on what you chose, you would then take it to your altar and you would say prayers over it and make sure that the angels or spirits attached to it know exactly what you want them to do. And you would exercise it and bless it and consecrate it. And now that's done. And now you have a working talisman. And there's nothing in there about having to charge it with energy. You don't ever have to worry about running out of energy. Uh, now, <clears throat> there is one thing that I wanted to bring up, and this is actually what inspired this video. Because for a very long time, uh, even I struggled with the idea that you never see anything in the Grim Wars about charging talismans. So, you know, I mean, with the consecration being so much like a charging, um, but yet the Grim Wars never say that it has to be re-consecrated on any regular basis. So I, I really wondered that. I, I couldn't get out of my modern um, uh, electricity, you know, uh, mindset on that. But then I actually found the answer. Uh, someone posted a quote from one of the older keys of Solomon called the Key of Rabbi Solomon. And in that, there's a kind of an offhand comment made. It says that once you've made your talisman, you have to, uh, especially with parchment, you have to be very careful not to allow the talisman to get dirty. Uh, any dirt that accrues on it will, uh, the more dirt that accrues on it, the less powerful the talisman will be. And that was the closest I had ever seen to the idea of a talisman losing its power. And once I read that, it really clicked into place and made sense. Because you consecrate something to make it holy and sacred. And part of keeping it holy and sacred is keeping it clean. Even in the Key of Solomon, you're supposed to make specially consecrated uh, silk or linen wrappings that you can put talismans and your magical tools in so that they don't sit there and collect dust or dirt. Uh, if uh, something sacred uh, in a church is dropped on the ground, or if it gets some kind of something, you know, you know, like uh, like animal waste, or uh, you know, just something dirty and unclean, if it comes into contact with that sacred object, the object has to be cleaned and re-consecrated because coming into contact with these unconsecrated things. Uh, is what makes it lose that, what we today would call charge. So that will destroy the consecration, and it will make the talisman less powerful. So that is why it's a good idea to keep your talisman wrapped up safely. Um, now, this isn't a universal thing. Like, for instance, uh, a lot of talismans are to be buried, and obviously they're going to be in contact with dirt. Even if you wrap them in something, that's going to degrade, and they'll still come into contact with, with dirt at some point. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily dirt or dust in and of itself. It's more about uh, it becoming the smirch. It's about it, a talisman or sacred object becoming dirty uh, in more of a religious sense uh, than a physical one. So, you know, keeping your, keeping, you know, metal things polished, keeping things dusted and wiped down and cleaned. Um, you know, uh, like my oratory behind me here, uh, I have to keep up with dusting it and keep spider webs away from it. And, you know, it, it's a constant struggle to keep it clean. And then once a year on my spiritual birthday, I will perform a, a, a full consecration of everything in the oratory, the altar, everything on the altar, uh, the lamp, the censer, the, uh, the curtains of the oratory itself, around the window of the oratory. And this is the closest I get to recharging it once a year. But it's not about charging. It's about making it sacred. So you get it nice and cleaned up, and then you re-consecrate it, because over the year it would have become dirty here and there. Um, so that's really what I wanted to go over. Um, it's, it, it's more about the, the state of the talisman. So if it's metal, if it gets, if it gets rusty, um, you know, if, if it gets scratched up, it, you know, just all of these things, uh, and of, of course tarnish, all of these things are going to degrade its power. The dirtier it gets, the less powerful it will be. Um, with a, a paper or parchment or wax talismans, you've got to keep those dusted and, and cleaned off as well uh, and wrapped up and safe. <laughs> Thank you.
and that's really all you'll find in the old grimoires. Uh, so you don't have to worry about how to charge the talisman. You don't have to worry about how to recharge the talisman. It's all pretty much built in to the way what you make it out of, uh, what you put on it, and when you do it. And once all of those are covered, and then you perform the consecration, it's a done deal. As long as it stays safe and clean and intact, then you've got a, a talisman that will simply keep working forever. There is no end to it. So I think I've uh, taken up enough of your holiday time. Uh, I will try my best to get something put together for uh, December, even though I know a lot of you are going to be busy with your families. So we'll just have to see how everything works out on that. But uh, thank you for spending this time with me. And I hope you learned a little bit about uh, the ancient art of talismans. Blessed be.